welcome to all of you. Shubhodayam, namaskaram. At the outset, wishing you all a very happy Deepavali, Govardhan Puja and Bhai Puja. Also to mention auspicious Karthik Masam Somvaram today. Friends, welcome to the third edition of Deccan Dialogue. Deccan Dialogue 2020, a conference on diplomacy, is an initiative of Indian School of Business in partnership with Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India. Started in 2018, Deccan Dialogue has grown as an annual flagship event aimed at promoting multi-stakeholder conversations on diplomacy and India's external engagement. Having successfully completed two annual editions, now we enter the third this year, a virtual event. So let me also welcome all our viewers and supporters who logged in from Facebook and YouTube. The event is being aired live on ISB Facebook and ISB YouTube pages. The first edition of Deccan Dialogue was held in 2018 on the theme Decentralized Cooperation and the second edition held in 2019 focused on the theme Diplomacy in the Age of Disruption. Currently, we are indeed facing heights of disruption due to the ongoing pandemic. The third edition of Deccan Dialogue will deliberate on the theme Crisis and Cooperation Imperatives in the Times of Pandemic. It is imperative that all stakeholders keep pace with the changes and engage in a policy dialogue where international, national and local stakeholders can come together to jointly address and respond to the crisis. This year, the Deccan Dialogue 2020 in its literal sense is going to be as exciting as a 2020 match with two power-packed dialogues besides an inaugural and a validity. Friends, as communicated to all of you earlier, due to some unavoidable circumstances, we are starting this conference with Dialogue 1, which will be then followed by Honorable External Affairs Minister's keynote address. The rest of the schedule throughout the day remains unchanged. Coming to Dialogue 1, in Telugu, they say, Arogyame Mahavagyam, health is the greatest wealth one can have. Friends, you must have heard the saying, if money is lost, nothing is lost, and if health is lost, something is lost. In fact, in this pandemic, we probably have to relook at and revise the saying and say, if health is lost, it's not just something, but so many things are lost. Health has become the most discussed issue of global politics. Health diplomacy is a diplomacy to manage major health challenges that affect the population. Dialogue 1 thus focuses on the most contemporary issue, India's critical role in healthcare diplomacy policy implications. COVID-19 has brought out some important challenges across the globe that would need coordinated and cooperated action. In the post-COVID scenario, what could be some better strategies to address future global healthcare challenges? Are scientific communities competing among each other or cooperating with each other? What do we learn from our current experience? Objective of the panel is to take stock of India's global agenda in healthcare management. Eminent experts from diverse areas are joining this dialogue. One, Ambassador Ron Mulka, Ambassador of Israel to India, Ambassador Rahul Chabra, Secretary Economic Relations, Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, Arti Ahuja, Additional Secretary, Health, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, Ambassador Vikram Dorai Swami, High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh, Dr. Krishna Ella. Chairman and Managing Director, Bharat Biotech International Limited, Professor M. Vidya Sagar, Distinguished Professor IIT Hyderabad, and also Chairman of Government of India's COVID panel, and our ISB's Professor Sarang Dev, Executive Director, Max Institute of Healthcare Management at Indian School of Business. This panel will be moderated by a senior and popular journalist who is also a successful entrepreneur, Mr. Govindraj Itraj, who is the founder of India Spend and Boom. Govind, I request you to take over. The pandemic, as we all know, is still raging strong. Uh, scientists around the world, along with research organizations and drug makers, along with governments, are working feverishly to find and now deliver a vaccine and hopefully a cure. Now, India is in step with the world on both counts, but has had commendable native success in treating COVID-19 and controlling the spread, at least so far. 
with a population of about uh, 1.3 billion people and some of the most talented scientists, medical experts and epidemiologists, India is both a consumer of vaccines and cures as well as a source for the rest of the world. Managing and building this strategic advantage and position will take another important aspect, which is diplomacy and what we might call now healthcare diplomacy. So it is in this context that uh, we are all happy to be uh, here in uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a somewhat unusual gathering of people, but a, uh, but a very critical one. And uh, one of those uh, platforms that the pandemic has thrown up, thrown up uh, and, and, and shown the direction, which is in many ways different from what we've seen in the past. So it is in this context that I'm going to invite uh, all our uh, speakers and panelists today. So I'm going to introduce them one by one. The flow is uh, quite simple. I'm uh, uh, requesting our panelists to speak for about five minutes on how they view this uh, uh, subject of India's critical role. And, and the, the term critical role is underlined in healthcare diplomacy from their vantage point, either in foreign affairs, economic affairs, and of course, uh, uh, manufacturing and academia. And, uh, and after which we will have a sh conversation and uh, maybe take some questions uh, from all of you or those of you who are watching. So thank you once again, thank you to ISB for inviting me to be part of this very fascinating panel and construct uh, as, uh, uh, as we start off today. So uh, let me first uh, uh, kick off by inviting uh, Professor uh, Mathukumali Vidyasagar the uh, Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering at IIT Hyderabad, and uh, as Sandeep mentioned, also the Chair of the COVID Panel uh, of the Government of India. Uh, Professor Vidya Sagar, it's over to you. Well, as mentioned, I chaired a panel that the Government of India had set up to model the spread of the corona pandemic in our country, both across time and also across geographies. And um, we have a good model that seems to have predicted the onset of the disease and also it's tail end. We believe that if people continue to follow the safety norms, the pandemic should be quite manageable by the end of uh, February of 2021. Now the theme of this workshop is uh, diplomacy and it's not clear what uh, a bunch of modelers like us can offer by way of diplomacy. So the only thing I can say is that India has uh, had conspicuously more success in controlling the pandemic compared with other countries like US, UK, France, which all have had daily, uh, have had death rates per million population, approximately seven to eight times that of India. And uh, at the same time, these countries have also now gone back to a second lockdown because they're seeing the so-called second wave. So this raises the question, uh, could proper modeling, modeling have uh, helped these countries to foresee that there would be a second wave? Could it have helped these countries to assess the effectiveness or the lack thereof of the first wave of lockdowns? And finally, and most important, uh, would the lockdown be more effective this time when it apparently wasn't all that successful the last time around. So these are the type of questions that other countries need to grapple with, and we perhaps can be of some use to them. Now, I should also point out in conclusion that India is not the only country that has done well. Uh, many countries along the equator have also done well. And rather surprisingly, Greece, which is very much in Europe, has death figures very comparable to those of India. So we should know what their secret is. So with those comments, I will uh, conclude. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Vidya Sagar. I mean, did you look at, or a uh, very quick question, did you look at or uh, at all examine human behavior or human response to, uh, let's say, government actions like a lockdown in, in your modeling? In India, yes, we did. Uh, in other countries that are now in the second phase of lockdown, no, we did not because our, our information was very, very sketchy. So basically, again, to take 30 seconds to summarize, uh, in congested areas like cities, the adherence to the safety protocol becomes of paramount importance. Once you get into the countryside where people have a much more outdoors kind of a lifestyle, I shouldn't say that adherence is not important because it's important everywhere, but lack of adherence to norms when people have an outdoors lifestyle does not seem to be quite so debilitating 
as it is in the cities. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Krishna Ella, uh, managing the chairman and managing director of Bharat uh, Biotech, also maker of the co-vaccine. Uh, it's over to you. I'm glad uh, the Ministry of Vaccine and Science is organizing such a wonderful meeting. I wish this was done even 10 years back. Um, I want to tell a few things as an entrepreneur, as a technologist. You know, when I came back from uh, 97 to India, do we do the, we have only one business model in India. The business model is make a generic vaccine, supply to UNICEF or supply to national immunization. That was only one strategy was there. So when I came as a scientist, should we do the same thing to keep the balance sheet in, intact or should we take a risk and do something different? So we looked at the pattern in the country. The most of the, the diseases in the developing world are neglected. And most of the neglected disease turned out to be the pandemic whether it's yellow fever, pandemic flu, or uh, chikungunya, Zika, all these kinds of diseases are neglected, are mostly in the developing world, and that is why it's getting into the pandemic in the global. So I looked at that angle. I said, okay, this is a game to play for us. So we took that decision almost 16, 17 years back, that decision. I was only 22 years old company. So we took that decision, and I will tell you a few examples where the Ministry of External Affairs also helped. Rotavac is a good example where we made all India sort of medical strain and we made that vaccine. But when we innovate, they don't have trust in the Indian uh, manufacturer. There's a problem in India as a brand we sometimes we face. So we, they think we are another generic vaccine, generic uh, companies. So to create that impact, so we have to do clinical trial in Palestinian, Zambia, Vietnam, and uh, Philippines. All those countries to create a trust for Indian products. We did that Rotavac. Now today, uh, we are saving healthcare cost of Palestinian, Ghana, Nigeria, and all those countries, bringing down their cost of uh, vaccines from almost 90% down. And whereas GSK sells at $65, we are selling at $1 to them and bringing their healthcare costs down significantly. And uh, today, same the children, and they published a lot of international journals also along with this to create a trust and create a diplomacy for Indian manufacturers. That's what we did. And typhoid conjugate. India never developed a new vaccine so far. I said we should do something for India, but not from India. So we developed a typhoid conjugate for that can go to children. The existing typhoid doesn't go to children, doesn't be not effective. We said we took that decision. We uh, made a vaccine, we approved, but then everybody questioned Indian vaccine, can we trust them? So that was another question we had to face the battle. Then Gate Foundation came into picture, they funded us. We have done a human challenge studies in Oxford, in UK, and we got 90% efficacy in human challenge studies published in Lancet Journal. And then UNICEF qualified. This is the first vaccine from India, globally acclaimed. Now, we are saving Pakistan children, 20 million children, uh, 20 million people, children, from the six months to 13 years old, children in Pakistan are saved with our vaccine. We are saving children in Zimbabwe, Zambia, and partly now Nigeria, Myanmar, all these places. And as we speak, we have completed a 600,000 clinical trial, babies trial in Bangladesh, Nepal, and Malawi, Burkina Faso. So how we created as a manufacturer, not just to make a product and sell to them, to create a confidence in them that yes, we are part of you. We are working with you. We show you the efficacy of the product. We've done that. And I think we are the only company in the world first want to make a chicken gunia vaccine, Zika vaccine. When my government also didn't believe the chicken gunia is an important vaccine, when I was working in 2006. And we made a pandemic flu, and we are the first one in the world to file a global patent on chicken gunia Zika. So what I'm trying to say is, 40,000 unknown viruses are existing right now. Only 10,000 viruses can hop in from the animals to animal and to human, or animal to human, animal. What we are seeing the today epidemic is a sample. It's only a sample what we are seeing COVID. It's because our economy is affected, so we got more attention. But otherwise, it's just a sample, and we are yet to see a lot of things, and I leave it to the few. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. So uh, you're saying that there are 9,999 other zoonotic diseases which we should Absolutely. be worrying about. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Not a not a very heartening thought uh, on a morning like this. But uh, tell us about the uh, uh, the, the forty thousand viruses that you spoke of. How, how many do we really need to be worried about at, at at any point of time? See, we can predict some of the model. 
I, I want Ministry of External Affairs have an epidemiologist in their science attache in their respective neighbor countries at least. So that, you know, we work with the Ministry of Health of every country so that, you know, whatever the problem is there, we can work with them in partnership. It's not that we want to spy them and take the material out. We want to work with them. Like, for example, I'll tell you one good example. We have poultry disease going to the humans in Africa, major problem. So Welcome Trust gave a $4 million grant to us. We produce the product and it doesn't have any market yet. It's a new action. We completed phase one trial in US because we want to create a trust to the African. We, want, we are not exploiting the Africans. Right. So we created a phase one trial in US and now bringing back to the Africa phase two or three manufacturing. So I think, you know, uh, we can predict, like for example, chicken gunia came to Canada. It came from French Island, Madagascar. So we asked a simple question. If it came from French Island, Madagascar, then what could come next from French Island, Madagascar? So there were only three, four diseases. One was dengue, chikungunya, and third was yellow fever, fourth was the Zika. That's how we predicted Zika may come to India. So like Columbus, instead of coming to India, it went to the Brazil and opposite direction. But otherwise, we predict that it can come. And we, we were the first one to have a global pattern on Zika vaccine right. uh, and, in and the that, world. And, and this, this, uh, the, the flow of the disease because of people obviously creates other diplomatic challenges, which we are all grappling with as we build our air bubbles as well. Last quick question before I move to uh, Ms. Ahuja. Uh, where do we stand, uh, Dr. Ella, on uh, your vaccine efforts? And I, I mean the COVID vaccine. I think uh, we, we, have, we are the only company in the world to have BSL-3 production facility. And I'm proud to say that. Okay? We predicted the pandemic will be a problem in the future. So we created BSL-3. Now China, with the $250 million, they're building the BSL-3 production facility. Even US doesn't have BSL-3 production, but they have land, not the production facility. Even Europe doesn't have. So we have experience in building those veterinary vaccine company in Bangalore, a BSL-3 plus production facility. That is also second one in the world, next to Fibrite in UK. So we built that. So then came this COVID. We partnered with ICMR, Covaxin. Now, as we speak, it's entered the phase three trial. But again, I'm not happy because it's a two-dose injectable vaccine. If we want to vaccinate 1.3 billion population, you need a two-dose vaccine. 2.6 billion syringes and needles has to reach. And you see the healthcare worker cannot give, you can mix up some other dilute, can give it to the village situation, a vaccine uh, with others dilute like insulin mixed up. It has happened right. in the world. And it can create a problem. So we are working on another vaccine, single-dose vaccine, nasal drop. And we are, because we have the experience of creating uh, a rotavirus first time in the world as a five drop concept, a polio two drop concept. So we are bringing the two drop concept of nasal drop, single dose that can scale up to one point billion, one, one billion doses. That right. my feeling is by next year, it will reach the entire. Uh, uh, Miss uh, Ahuja, uh, it's over to you. Arti Ahuja is the uh, it's an India, Indian Administrative Services Officer and an additional secretary health at the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Government of India. She's coming to this role uh, during the lockdown in the month of May. So let's accept that this is something that we are going to live with. And almost a decade back, the WHO, they have uh, a panel on international health regulations. And I'll just like to quote what they said about 10 years back. They said that the world is ill-prepared to handle a severe influenza pandemic. At that time, that was the, the raging uh, pandemic or any such globally sustained and threatening public health emergency. And uh, supposedly, uh, they, were, uh, they had in mind countries like ours, which uh, have traditionally been associated with uh, public health systems, which uh, quote unquote, uh, uh, do not work. So, but today when we look at the handling of the COVID pandemic and what India has done, and although it's unfair to compare, but if you look at, you know, you look at any pandemic, what do people remember? You, we talk about the Spanish flu, etc. What do people remember? They remember how many people died. And if you take that as a single indicator, then you find that India, the deaths per million are only 94 deaths per million. And we compare with the best of the countries, the developed countries, United States, uh, which is on the other end of the spectrum, it is 759 deaths per million. And uh, uh, UK, it is 764 deaths per million. So we are talking of 94, a country like us. So we, this is something that we must be very proud of. And how did this happen? Right? What did we do right? We had a proactive, a preemptive, and a graded response. 
to the uh, pandemic. Now, if you remember that, uh, you know, it was only on the 7th of January of this year that China identified the coronavirus, the, the COVID-19. And India, next day itself, we had our joint monitoring group. And on 17th, we issued the advisory. Whereas the WHO declared it as a public health emergency of international concern much, much later on 30th January. And as a pandemic on 11th March, by which time India had already moved ahead with its planning. When the virus came in, we only had one public health lab laboratory in the country which could test the RT-PCR lab. Today we have 2000 plus. We did not have PPE manufacturing facility in our country. Today we have 109 manufacturers with 2.5 crores already manufactured. We didn't have N95 manufacturers here. Today we have 10 of them. We didn't have ventilator manufacturing facility in our country. Today we have 25 plus manufacturers. And not only for the country, we are now exporting to other countries. So we have reached that stage. How did we do that? I would say it's not just the government. It was a whole of government approach. It was not just the Ministry of Health. It was everybody. There, you know, at the top level, there was the group of ministers across ministries. There was the committee of secretaries. And then empowered groups were set up, which were again cross-ministerial, which were empowered to take decisions. And they have been extremely helpful. Today, we are facing, uh, we don't have a crisis of oxygen because the empowered group dealing with that is taking stock of that, right? So this kind of a strategy helped. And I would say the private sector, like Bharat Biotech and others, the manufacturers, the experts, the scientists, it is everybody who participated and most of all the healthcare workers on the field, who till they are doing relentless work, very sincerely. So, so it was an all of government and an all of society approach. And also the scientific principles were applied right in the beginning. What were those? Things like contact tracing, things like containment zones, detailed guidelines were issued. And this, and you know, very intensive reviews were held and even till date, which is what led to a kind of containment of the epidemic, I would say. And if I'm not running out of time, I would also like to tell that this kind of said use into the digital health. How IT platforms were used, and this was again shared globally. We have a global digital health partnership. Uh, we have a joint task force with the SARC countries, with BRICS nations. Uh, on the WHO platform, we have an integrated health information system. You know, so all those things, transparent data sharing, analysis, uh, the studies that have been done elsewhere, uh, feeding into our inputs, so all those things. So it was truly the digital uh, media actually created a, a lot of uh, sharing, which may not have been possible otherwise. And uh, of course, we all know about the diplomacy that happened earlier in by way of evacuation of people, not just Indians, but other countries from China, the air bubbles that we had, the Vande Bharat flights that we had all uh, in collaboration with NEA. So all those things, uh, you know, have happened. And uh, maybe I can answer the, you know, other things. Uh, maybe I'm running out of time, but other things when the questions come. Right. So, you know, one of the questions that I pose uh, to someone like you, though more in the in the business space is that, you know, there's clearly an adrenaline of crisis driving this and which is why things come together so well. And the question always is, uh, will it sustain uh, once the crisis ebbs? Uh, will, the, will we see the same levels of cooperation? Are we or, are we, or would we be able to hold this together uh, to scale and to, to face the more sustained challenges that we face? Uh, and, and I do ask in the context of health. You can answer that later, but if you want to take a stab at it right now, go ahead. So very quickly, you know, I think uh, a good uh, management is when we learn from our experiences, right? So this pandemic has shown not just the government, but everybody, the merits of collaboration. And we can see that happening a lot. Whether it is sustainable or not, I would say yes. Although the crisis does give an adrenaline rush and there is 
you know, a lot of energy flowing from all sides. But I think uh, the realization has come. It was always already there, but probably got more illuminated that yes, collaboration is always beneficial. It helps. Okay, uh, uh, thank you for that. On uh, and that's a very uh, uh, strategic point to segue to Ambassador Rahul Chabra, who's uh, a Secretary Economic Relations for the Ministry of External Affairs, Government of India, and I'm sure he's able to look at this and uh, give us a wider perspective on how India has been looking at uh, this whole pandemic, uh, uh, both economically and otherwise. Go ahead, Ambassador Chabra. Uh, first, I begin by thanking Dr. Krishna Ayla for those kind words. I mean, they're not lost on us. Uh, we appreciate the, some credit that sometimes Government of India gets. Uh, so thank you for those words. And your suggestion of uh, closer epidemiological collaboration with neighboring countries has been noted. So let's see what, how we can take it forward, whether we actually post them or send them out or how we collaborate on that front. So that's being taken on board. Uh, I have to thank uh, Arti is at the ground, uh, ground basis about the domestic situation. She also segued into the international portion, so that eases my role. Uh, so I'll just begin by sort of uh, mentioning that how this pandemic has uh, brought out a completely new aspect to international diplomacy and international relations in terms of uh, non-military threats to security. Until now, people only thought of you know, military threats to security. So health security has now come up as a major issue and uh, how it's important to have multilateral cooperation and this is also one of the, like climate change, uh, issues that cross borders and cuts across borders very easily. And it has to now be part of our strategic foreign policy engagement with many countries, maybe every country. Also, uh, it sort of uh, brings out our own uh, ancient and enlightened philosophy of Vasudev Kutumbukam. So uh, the whole world is one. I mean, uh, and we are only as strong as the weakest link. Uh, so I think we tend to forget that. Uh, so that has also been clearly brought out. And the third big picture issue that's come out is that India has really emerged as a net provider of health security in this uh, time. So the whole uh, world, the global uh, community has realized uh, India's sort of role in that sense. Uh, so coming uh, quickly to that, I mean, uh, it was touched upon. Uh, the hydroxychloroquine and paracetamol we supplied to over 150 countries. Uh, so, and what is more important is that more than half of these countries uh, received it on non-commercial basis. So these were sort of grants from the government of India and it was as a goodwill gesture. Uh, but uh, not that even supplying it to the other half or less than half on commercial basis was really, I mean, we had opened up our supply chains, the governments worked overtime, the companies worked overtime to produce the stuff and then to get it out to those countries. So there was a lot of collaboration and facilitation that Aarti mentioned about that went on, uh, where she brought in, of course, the Vande Bharat and all that, so I won't go into all that. Uh, but uh, we, of course, focused a lot on the Global South because they are the ones who are probably lacking uh, resources to produce and to uh, have these uh, vaccines availability. Uh, what else we specifically did at the Ministry of External Affairs in terms of a global outreach uh, was uh, the e-iTech program, where we actually trained uh, people across the world, again, mainly SARC countries and across Africa. I was in Africa just before coming here. So it was very much appreciated. And these were really India's top institutes. Uh, these were from AIMS, All India Institute of Management Sciences, for those of us who aren't aware of that, and PGI Chandigarh, the Postgraduate Institute in Chandigarh. So these were renowned institutions that were conducting these EITEC courses, which was, again, uh, a lots of uh, healthcare workers, clinical specialists logged in and benefited from our training, which was given free of cost, of course. Uh, and in that context, uh, we have now, of course, uh, working on this telemedicine project, just uh, going a bit forward uh, with Africa specifically, EVABAB, uh, which will link up all of Africa with Indian uh, healthcare uh, industry. So this is a satellite link and should be work coming up in the next few months. Uh, SARC, uh, we, again, uh, I don't want to get into that. We have Ambassador Dureswami here, but uh, COVID uh, information exchange platform was set up. Uh, in addition to that, over $10 million has been contributed uh, to the emergency fund for SARC. Uh, in terms of uh, the little wider neighborhood, uh, there were rapid response teams that were sent to Kuwait and the Maldives. Uh, there were medical assistance teams which went to Mauritius and Comoros. 
Uh, so our actually teams went out to these four countries. Uh, just last week, uh, over 175 ambassadors and representatives of international organizations were called in for a briefing, uh, transparent, open uh, briefing, Q&A, on uh, where we are, what's expected, and how the way forward. Uh, so it's being done in a very, uh, and visits are being planned for these uh, ambassadors and representatives. We will arrange that uh, for those of them interested to go and visit uh, some of the facilities and see for themselves uh, how the progress is uh, being achieved. Uh, now coming into the really multilateral in, uh, international arena, at the UN, uh, there was a UN resolution on fair and equitable access to this uh, vaccines and medicines, which we signed on to uh, India. Uh, UNICEF for supplied essential drugs. Uh, as you're all aware, now we have our cabinet minister for health, who's on the WHO chairman of the executive board, where we are coordinating international uh, responses to this pandemic. And even more international policy coordination at the G20, uh, Prime Minister Modi mentioned that the global humanitarian issues are maybe as important and same urgency as global financial and economic issues, which again, we tend to ignore. So that issue was brought out at the G20. Uh, at BRICS, uh, again, Aarti mentioned that, and Indo-Pacific. Uh, at the UNGA, uh, we, we uh, said that we would enhance our commitment and have uh, uh, explain and sort of uh, uh, get our uh, cold storage uh, technologies, cold chain technologies out as much as possible to the countries that need it. Uh, so we have been, this is the international policy coordination that we have into. Of course, uh, traditional medicines are being talked about also, uh, Ayurveda and uh, the boost to uh, immunity and all that, which I thought Aarti might touch upon, but since uh, it got left out. Uh, we in the high commissions and, and embassies, we have done that. Uh, so it's always on top of our mind. So, you know, so at any occasion, we try to uh, promote that. So uh, that's uh, getting in. And I'd just like to end by mentioning that uh, there couldn't have been a better venue than Hyderabad at the ISB to have conducted this uh, seminar at that moment, as you're all aware of uh, Hyderabad's importance in our uh, Indian medical supply industry. So on that note, uh, I look forward to any other ideas and suggestions that may come up other than the one we've noted from Dr. Ella. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Chabra. So a quick question. You talked about, you know, how health security is going to be critical or has become now critical. Uh, can you build on that a little bit? And just, just that one question before I move on to uh, Ambassador Dorai Swami. I know. I mean, uh, just uh, it, it normally in discussions in international meetings, which many of us have attended, uh, I mean, health security was, I mean, it didn't even feature. Uh, so coming from reaching the top of the agenda, I mean, it required a pandemic like this to bring it right up there. Uh, but otherwise, uh, we were only talking about, you know, it was generally military. And then we had reached the environment and, you know, global uh, warming and stuff like that. So health was considered, you know, uh, it's okay. Everybody is happy and safe and sound. And, you know, so these sort of issues didn't really come onto the table. Uh, today, I mean, the pandemic has really shown, I mean, nobody is uh, safe until all of us are safe because you don't know who's not safe. So it is a complete mindset change, you know? So uh, it's therefore, come on, therefore health security is now probably, as I said, it is top of the agenda. And, and uh, I mean, this is a somewhat uh, a subjective point and question, but relevant nevertheless. I mean, uh, Ms. Ahuja mentioned, you know, I mean, India does have a much lower uh, uh, death per million rate than most other countries. And uh, we've been uh, successful and lucky so far. Now, does this tilt, uh, you know, the global economic uh, equations are built on certain parameters, which are historical and known to all of us. Is, do you see this tilting? Do you see balances and equations tilting because of, let's say, uh, uh, our relative healthier status today, uh, as compared to others uh, who might otherwise have been economically or militarily stronger than us? Uh, it would. I mean, I think uh, any person making his calculations would factor in these sort of uh, numbers. So uh, this is this is something to be seen. How it, how much it contributes, and assuming the, our healthy trends continue like this, so it would be a definitely a plus in any calculations that will be made in the future. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, let me uh, go on to Ambassador uh, Vikram K. Dorai Swami, High Commissioner of India to Bangladesh. Uh, he, uh, too, is a recent recruit to this uh, particular role. He took over as ambassador just a month ago. So uh, 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 over to you and uh, where were you before this? Uh, thank you. Uh, great pleasure to be here on this panel. Um, I was in Delhi actually working okay. as uh, additional secretary international organizations in which capacity 
I had the opportunity to work with uh, DBT, Ministry of Health, um, and of course, our companies, in particular, uh, Bharat Biotech, and it's a it's a great pleasure to see Dr. Krishna Ilad, and I want to salute him and the work that Bharat Biotech and all, and indeed all our uh, companies are doing in promoting Brand India as a place for safe, reliable, and top tier medical care and vaccines. So God bless you all for, for all of that wonderful work. Um, let me in my four minutes and 45 seconds uh, quickly say the following. Uh, let me summarize my remarks in two quick blocks. One is what we did on the global and the regional front, which uh, you know I'll, I'll try not to repeat what uh, my senior colleague Rahul just said. Um, on the global and uh, regional front, we had the plurilateral responses, which the first of which was at the SARC Leader Summit right up in March itself, uh, a SARC COVID emergency fund, um, uh, the in SEPI effort that is now currently under, underway with uh, for clinical research capacity in the neighborhood, RRTs that were sent out, digital task forces with SARC, training for, for, uh, for countries in the SARC region and beyond. Then a second block was participation in plurilateral fora in a science-based endeavor to shore up global capacity. This includes our work with SEPI, includes our work with Gavi, the ACT accelerator in which principal scientific advisor, uh, Dr. Vijay Raghavan, Professor Vijay Raghavan, and of course, uh, Niti IO uh, member, uh, Dr. Vinod Paul have played an important role. Uh, then, of course, there is the action that has taken place in the UN, which Rahul summarized, and uh, our own Minister for Health, his involvement on in the WHO Executive Council as President of the Council, Chairman of the Council, uh, the supply of uh, medicine, medical products, and PPE kits, all of which were ramped up, as Aarti mentioned, uh, for production for and now our capacity to produce in the world, which is the third set of points I wanted to make that uh, we're now producing and capable of producing for the global uh, supply chain, which includes everything from diagnostic kits and uh, mobile lab, uh, labs to uh, medical devices at affordable prices, production of vaccines, uh, field sites for clinical trials. Let's not forget that's a hugely important part of it. It's one thing to produce it. It's another thing to be able to actually try it. And so India is today a base for not only production of our own indigenous vaccine streams, but also global vaccine product products which will also be tried in India, like the, everything from the Russian uh, Sputnik vaccine to, to the Aus Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And I see that Bharat Biotech is also working, I think it's with Johnson's for, for an American produced vaccine stream. So you have a range of opportunities that's being provided by India with now the new, uh, new pillar of uh, cooperation, which is the PACT program, Partnership for Accelerating Clinical Trials uh, with support of CP, WHO and NIH. Uh, the COVID vaccine intelligence network, and of course, whatever we will now do to bring new uh, diagnostic technologies, including working with our Israeli friends, and as Dr. Krishnaila said, a nose uh, nose drop uh, variant of the vaccine. Second part I wanted to talk about, which is implicit in your title of the event, the policy implications of what we're doing. Well, there is first of all the internationalist approach. Responding to a larger global need is a critical part of what we should be doing. So there is a foreign policy benefit to us, uh, in a sense, uh, promoting India as a, 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 a collaborative partner in the international system and a public health benefit, which, of course, as uh, Rahul said, you, you, know, you, you can only be as strong and as healthy as the, uh, as the weakest link in the global chain. And uh, since this is now a global pandemic, it's logical that there is a global response to it. And so India's approach has been precisely that. A second point under this is the idea of which has been a long-standing principle in India, and I think um, others have alluded to it, uh, Sipla's Dr. Hamid had alluded to it in the past. Um, we have always stood for the notion of a more globally equitable regime for healthcare, in particular access for medicine and vaccines. Dr. Krishnaila referred to the $65 GSK vaccine shot uh, for, I think, Rotovac, and the $1 shot that, we, uh, that uh, he's providing. It's a similar thing that was done in the case of AIDS, if you remember, in, under the PEPFAR uh, challenge and what happened in Africa with, uh, with the cost of uh, antiretrovirals uh, dosages. So that's a second major point. A third is expansion of a multilateral approach. The idea that countries with capacities need to work together in a way that, it, that is fundamentally non-mercantilist, as distinct from what the WHO DG calls vaccine nationalism. Uh, Sorry, my timer is telling me that, that I've finished my five, five minutes. I have two more points quickly to make. 
uh, generating openness in partner countries in India to the opportunity to share best practices and to learn from each other. Because there are things that our neighbors have also done that are quite remarkable. For instance, Bangladesh has done a very good job in distributed management of healthcare at the local level. So there is, when you start processes for collaboration, you start picking up opportunities that other people are doing and you sort of take from them. Then there is cooperation of the neighborhood, which has public health benefits, but also economic benefits. If, for instance, you create regional capacities, if, for instance, in Kumila, in eastern uh, Bangladesh, you have high quality hospitals, then uh, the neighboring towns like Bellonia on our side, which are really close by, can actually benefit from quality healthcare on this side, just as people from, from uh, Jashore in Bangladesh have the opportunity to benefit from quality healthcare in Calcutta. So the idea of starting to think beyond borders when you look at healthcare, that comes from the kind of work that we're doing. Finally, if I can take another 30 seconds, conclusions. I'd say we should recognize that the pandemic has taught us, if nothing else, a little humility, all of us, the globe as a word. The fact that India has been able to show all the criticism that has been heaped upon our system, our, our pandemic rates, uh, our fatality rates were very low. Bangladesh too, even admittedly on a comparatively lower testing base, is, is basically turning out uh, fatalities at about 40 per million, uh, which is quite a fantastic uh, performance. Uh, then there is also the fact that I think narrative management is now critical. It's important for policymakers to recognize that developing countries and LDC countries have healthcare needs that need to be factored in and not necessarily taking public health uh, sort of priorities from developed countries. Uh, our, our colleague from the health ministry will rec remember the issue about AIDS, for instance. For a long while, we were driving down the road of focusing on ARVs rather than other, other, other major healthcare and lifestyle diseases that are major challenges for us. So there is an, an, an issue of being able to manage narratives in developing countries and something like this, our uh, initiatives today are a huge opportunity to do that. And finally, uh, the value of innovative approaches that are globally oriented. So if we can pick things that can be that work well here and replicate them. So for instance, you create knowledge networks like Dr. Krishna Ella's idea of having healthcare specialists, at least in developing countries or neighboring countries to recognize what might be the next big hit coming your way. Um, fortuitously, we have two um, MV, uh, sort of, you know, doctors, uh, foreign service officers uh, in our mission in Dhaka. So we're actually in a privileged position of being able to work with the health, health ministry here much better than we would if it had been just some schmo like me who doesn't actually have any degree worth, uh, worth the name since I graduated with a master's in history. But the fact is there is value in what you said and we should see how we can move this forward without even institutionally changing things. Thank you, I've run on beyond my time. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ambassador Rasmami. I'm gonna come back to you later in, a, in a little bit with some questions, but let's move on quickly. Uh, it's over to Professor Sarang Dio, Executive Director, uh, Max Institute of Healthcare Management at the Indian School of Business. Uh, he's done a lot of work in, uh, uh, in operations and supply chains uh, in, and including in the context of COVID in Punjab. Thank you, Govind. And this is a position which is difficult given that I'm following a lot of experts, uh, including diplomats. So I have very little to say in terms of healthcare diplomacy, but as I was cogitating, I realized that there are two or three questions uh, which we can use to frame this conversation. Uh, first is, uh, what is the purpose? What's the objective? And I see two flavors to this. One is health cooperation across countries for diplomatic ends. You know, this is sort of the soft power argument. Uh, and the second is then use of existing diplomatic ties to further health uh, overall. Uh, this is one of the major peacetime objectives. So those are two broad objectives under which we can frame our activities, our thoughts. Uh, who should be doing health diplomacy? So I'm very glad to hear about all the efforts that the uh, external affairs ministry is undertaking. But it is well known that there are other players in the country who could also contribute. Dr. Ella obviously is leading that effort, but there are healthcare delivery organizations, talk about even private hospitals or charitable hospitals, um, upcoming health entrepreneurs, technology entrepreneurs who could be used as drivers of some aspects of healthcare diplomacy. And last, which is sort of my main point of discussion is what should be the vehicles of healthcare diplomacy? In what shape or form would this actually happen? Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, so I have five P's to go through very quickly, but the first P which we talked about a, a lot is products. So products could be vaccines, could be medical devices, could be drugs. 
and india is well known for these products right so we are known to be the pharmacy of the world we have a lot of capacity for vaccine production also increasing developmental effort so that's great the second p which we didn't talk too much about but is also well known is people right so it it is said that nhs cannot run without india's doctors and nurses several other developed countries are benefiting from the export that we are making in terms of human capital and so that's something that we should be able to leverage on both within the health sector diplomacy and diplomacy broadly uh, and i'm sure efforts are underway to do that uh, these are tangible p's and there are intangible p's three of them which i want to mention uh, processes programs and policies right so if i start at the at the lowest level processes so individual hospitals we are already known to be destinations for uh, medical tourism uh, which means people are coming crossing borders and and getting high quality care here so how can we leverage that position that we have second is um, uh, second aspect is charitable organization so i work with a lot of them uh, such as arvind i care who export ideas of how to organize healthcare delivery systems at scale uh to african countries again you know these efforts are happening you know piecemeal in pockets could they be brought under some umbrella um the the second p in intangibles is program so you know tb is a big problem in india uh, india's government and state governments are taking a lot of efforts i've been lucky to be part of some of those efforts um but possibly the way we are structuring the program the way we have ambitiously now called the program as elimination program rather than control program could be ideas for export to other countries that are similarly struggling with uh, those diseases um and then to the final p which is policy so you know we talk a lot domestically about uh, ayushman bharat pnj scheme uh, nha in our efforts to universalize healthcare um how can we take some of those ideas to other countries and say hey we've been able to orchestrate this large machinery in a very complex environment federal structure and here are the lessons for other countries um and you know all of this the, the, the last three intangible pieces in my view require very very careful documentation of evidence that hey this works here in these settings and although the country is different although maybe some you know socio political issues are different but some aspects of the system are similar so the learnings could be transplanted from here to there and i think we need to promote i mean now i'm speaking as an academic and researcher from my vantage point that we need much more careful documentation of efforts which stands the scrutiny of peer review um, i mean if you just looked at number of publications in top international journals coming out across countries um, i mean we should be right up there given our scale given the number of academics that we have um anything that can be done to promote that because you know our evidence and our experience could add to the um, international dialogue and the last bit i'm happy uh, you know ambassador dorai swami mentioned this sort of the two way communication so we are not here only to export we could also learn and a year or two ago when uh, we were talking about health systems at the at the central level um, there was a, a discussion of how do we learn from countries like thailand so we should always be looking at you know developed countries uh, maybe experiments have worked in other countries of similar um you know economic status and so as as much as we want to export our ideas we also want to import some of the ideas because that leads to you know deeper relationships long standing ties etc so i'll stop there i i may have run out of my 5 minutes but i'm happy to take questions later a uh, quick question uh, professor dio so why is it that uh, we have all this experience successes and a, ob obviously a vast pool of uh, scientific talent knowledge understanding insights and that's not converting into the the academic output and publications that you refer to yeah i mean that's that's absolutely a a, a good topic to have a separate discussion okay. on i think it's it's well known that the yeah. uh, that the incentives in indian academic environments are different than those where large production of scientific knowledge happens uh, and we could talk more about that uh, but i think what we also need to recognize is you know indian health system itself is highly fragmented right so take any take take drugs take hospitals there's lot of small players and there may be lot of good ideas floating around and so unless there is a co coalescence of these ideas into some larger programs umbrellas it's going to be difficult to get the critical mass uh, i mean i know there are pockets of excellence and we become uh, 
entities within let's say multi centric trials across different uh, countries and now that we have one of our own as the chief scientific uh, right. advisor in, in who hopefully things will move in the right direction okay so we're going to tee up uh, ambassador ron malka's uh, video but uh, you know uh, professor due to your point you know i was interviewing doctors in uh, bilwada uh, and jaipur in uh, april and uh, you know and then they were talking for instance about the kind of uh, uh, combination treatments that they were using and at that time the trial and error factor was much higher than it is today uh, and succeeding uh, and somehow i always felt that uh, that uh, knowledge or understanding was not getting institutionalized faster or maybe not at all uh, i mean but this is a more a journalist anecdotal uh, response but i've seen that throughout april may june july uh, you know i could see more and more doctors getting more confident uh, in their treatment protocols uh, intensive care pulmonologists uh, cardiologists uh, post uh, you know sort of post covid uh, uh, complications and so on but somehow the the conversion is low but we can talk about that later we, uh, as we look more at the future so on that note uh, let's listen now to what uh, ambassador ron malka has to say good afternoon and thank you for inviting me to speak here today i'm going to speak about the importance of collaboration between countries especially in challenges that have no borders like the uh, covid-19 challenge Israel and India can be a shining example for how I think things should be. After the breakout of the pandemic, and once we realize that it will take time until we uh, will uh, manage to immune all the population, the Israeli scientists has decided to focus on uh, uh, finding some technologies that will give us immediate results, rapid tests for COVID-19. The first, one of the first partners that I thought about was India, since it's been a long time that Indian scientists and uh, Israeli scientists, both from ministers of defense, guided by the principal scientific uh, advisor for Prime Minister Modi, were working together, a joint research together. So they knew each other. It was just natural for them to uh, start working together. And it was so successful and so efficient that in one stage, of this uh, 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 joint research, Israeli scientists came to India and with their Indian partners, within nine days, they managed to take 25,000 samples. Okay, so let's uh, uh, let's move on. There are uh, some questions that have come in. Uh, a couple of questions on Bangladesh, uh, Ambassador Dora Swami, but uh, I'm just sort of alerting you to it, but I'll, we'll come back to that later. Uh, let me come back to you, Dr. Della. So, you know, uh, give us a sense on where uh, and how the distribution is going to happen. Uh, you know, uh, you did talk about timelines. You did talk about, uh, you know, uh, summer being uh, uh, the rollout phase. Uh, but, you know, the Pfizer vaccine is uh, likely to hit earlier. But is not going to reach us. Uh, what is uh, your output sense like? How much of it is going to remain in India? What's going to go out? And uh, then, I mean, maybe the diplomatic aspect can come in. I mean, uh, scale is very important right now. Uh, our co-vaccine, inactivated vaccine production capacity is limited because of the PSL3 containment. Let's come. But as we speak, Chinese, out of five manufacturers, all the four manufacturers are manufacturing the same inactivated vaccine. We don't know what the science is, but we are yet to understand a lot of science. But it looks like inactivated seems to be working very well uh, compared to US and Europe cannot manufacture because they don't have BSL-3 first. Pfizer vaccine, I mean, they have not developed a very good product range. So it's come in minus 80 and all that, but still mRNA vaccine, the long drawn, what are the side effects for other issues? We are yet to see that. Uh, but it's a good for a pandemic right now, for the US it's really good. But certainly, I think uh, India also will catch up uh, quickly in that type of programs, uh, not far away. But we are coming with a different strategy of NAS and drop, which are easy to deliver. Even Anganwadi worker in the village can deliver this sort of strategy. Because uh, unless we reach 1.3 billion population at the last, and we, I think my ideal model is I want India as the first country in the world to be entire 100% population is vaccinated in one year. That's my dream. And for the dream, I don't know whether I succeed or not, but certainly the Minister of Health can help me on the strategy. Uh, we can do that model. It's a risky model, but it's worth trying. And we can be a model that we can show to other part of the world that yes, we have done it, the entire strategy 1.3. Africa is a small population. Bangladesh is small, other countries are smaller population. We can reach and we can help you those things. And I think we can certainly establish 
and every two out of three children in the world are vaccinated with indian vaccines so indian vaccine industry far ahead of any other world vaccine industries in the world but we don't get recognition unfortunately in india because we are indian manufacturers but we are far ahead compared to even uh, europe and the us and even uh, china and other part can i can i uh, just uh, uh, pick on that once again i mean uh, so one is that these vaccines uh, unlike most other or if not all other vaccines are aimed at adults uh, and the most of your work has been in uh, in children as is the case can you take us through the broad numbers again i mean how many vaccine doses do you think india can produce and by when how much of it can we use within india uh, in what time frame assuming all things go well and how much would go out because i'm sure uh, what you will receive uh, as uh, compensation would be higher maybe in dollar terms versus what you get paid and you are uh, a, a company which also has to respond i mean is responsible to shareholders i mean um, uh, for unfortunately i mean fortunately i don't have too many shareholders to uh, talk about it i accept ifc uh, washington uh, but what i want to say is we are not greedy for money we really want public when a crisis is there we want to help like covaxin i never took any money from the government we don't want to exploit the government for the sake of the crisis so i never done that we will do i, I can tell you what you asked me scale up we are looking at it the as a drop vaccine we can scale it to 1 billion doses and when we maybe we can partner with pakistan bangladesh we can partner with uh, african country and we can make a lot of small domestic manufacturers also see that help them the country to self sustain because the vaccine has become a nationalism now so every country want to have their own protection their own mechanism of uh, protection of security so how do you give the comfort to the country is uh, right. our minister of external affairs diplomacy can help us right and uh, okay i'm going to come to uh, ambassador chabra in a second uh, uh, go ahead uh, uh, professor vidya sagar you wanted to make a point yes i just wanted to make a small point uh, you said that um, <clears throat> very early in the pandemic during april uh, the doctors in rajasthan tried out some therapies which did not become institutionalized that's what you said and as i said i did not fully agree because those doctors were the first ones to try remdesivir and favipiravir and those are now completely mainstream uh, as therapies now the thing is indians being indians we did not push our claims very aggressively to being the pioneers but if you say that uh, did we actually pioneer the therapies without necessarily claiming credit i would say yes we did remdesivir is a costly drug but favipiravir is much cheaper and that has contributed to our very low case fatality rate i just wanted to make that point okay so uh, ambassador chabra you know the the uh, dr elart spoke about trust uh, and he spoke about the challenges of trust uh, in in this direction as in indian products or indian vaccines or drugs being trusted by overseas uh, we are in a funny situation perhaps uh, that uh, we too now have to trust uh, what maybe let's say your counterparts uh, in other countries uh, maybe china russia for instance are, uh, are are manufacturing or trying to distribute so we, we, how do you look at this situation and how do you manage this delicate tension if one may call it that uh you know uh, having served across the world uh, so i have seen that uh, i think everybody is quite well educated now more and more so uh, so uh, for us to sort of uh, think that you know we may be able to somehow uh, so so we can do our uh, talk about our products uh, they can all make the comparison so everybody knows cost price comparison quality uh, reliability you know so these are pretty standard uh, across the world so as long as we are making a good product safe product selling it uh, reasonably delivering on time uh, there is a brand reputation already created in the market so if you go out to the players i mean it's really not that uh, these guys don't know or they are uh, you know waiting to be informed type of thing uh, they are aware uh, so we just need to sort of uh, make sure that our product is right up there and which we are doing now more and more uh, as with every passing year and uh, that will be done so we as uh, our role there is really to sort of uh, bring this issue up to the fore up to right. the forefront and uh, you know do the best that we can in that sense and 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 how do you see the see the reverse flow i mean you know there is a chinese vaccine uh, there is the sputnik 5 now uh, you know you know should, should we distribute it in india aggressively should we be uh, what's the next what's what's the way forward 
that i think is for the healthcare professionals <laughs> and uh, you know to okay. to decide if if uh, dr ella feels that he's not able to make enough and give us uh, then we might have to get from wherever it's available you know i think okay. that's really uh, let me yeah. get the health view uh, ms ahuja go ahead i mean if if you have a view on this i mean uh, you know finally as a country with such a large population we need everything uh, we need dr ella's capacity we may need uh, uh, you know american uh, european russian chinese how how do you how are you looking at this balance going forward so let me make two points about that the first is that there's a national empowered group on the vaccine for carried by the call it is looking into all these aspects and a lot depends on the supply capacity on of various vaccines manufacturers it also depends on the efficacy of vaccine and more importantly it also depends on how we prioritize the vaccine recipients right so it's all something that is being worked out right now but i would like to actually talk about something which is right now in as a state being done uh, you know that india has a new health person immunization program we vaccinate about 27 million children and about 9 million women every year so that used to stop at the level of the sub center where the asha would give the vaccine to the child that is now being uh, morphed or being reworked to Uh, go to the end user, the end recipient of the vaccine, and it is now being called COVID. So we are working very extensively on that, and that is something that uh, the honourable prime minister has also uh, said that that is something that as a product which is modular, which we can share with other countries. You know, there would be many countries which would not have that logistics capacity or the ability to monitor. this software actually tells you at this cold chain point this is the temperature this many vials of vaccine are there etc so it's a very detailed and a very efficient system right now so this is something that we are actually working on and which may be shared with other countries as a good will gesture uh, they could you know pick up different modules of it so i i just wanted to end with that and what uh, vikram said that i think this whole pandemic has been a huge exercise in humility for all, all of us and also uh, it right in the way people have come together across both citizens entrepreneurs you know regular uh, healthcare workers down in the field uh, other sanitary workers the police people everybody has come together and it's it's been an amazing uh, effort on part of the country and i feel really blessed that i'm part of it right and and uh, thank you for that you've also answered a question uh, that came in on precisely that on uh, where we stand and how we are looking at uh, covid-19 vaccine distribution in india uh there's a point from uh, professor uh, uh, vidya sagar again he says uh, this is to ambassador chabra he says is reliability of supply now more important than price uh yes uh, i mean i think uh, again the world is sort of changing in that sense but there will always remain a market that will be price sensitive so you can never say uh, which is more it depends on which market i mean ha- having been from iim calcutta i think i can get into a marketing strategy session now so i don't want to go do go that way but uh, uh, yeah uh, at in certain price segments which are uh, obviously reliability of supply will be more important but there definitely going to be a huge market where price sensitivity will be more important than reliability of supply okay and i am calculate to my knowledge does produce uh, most of the marketing geniuses uh, in this country so uh, uh, <laughs> I, i i i bow to that okay uh, uh i'm asking the rest of me a couple of questions on bangladesh and uh, you know how is it that uh, bangladesh is managing this so well uh, the other question and let me sort of make it a little broader is uh, what's how do you see the whole uh, south asian uh, uh, you know the the, the 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 sphere of south asian countries uh, manage and work going forward uh, when it comes to either exchanging knowledge or uh, flow of uh, vaccines as and when they come thank you for that uh, if i could just very briefly since um, as arti correctly said negvac is the uh, just to uh, sort of partially address a question of yours that went out about other vaccines and since um, before i got here i was uh, representing our foreign secretary on the uh, negvac meetings 
I can tell you that the approach to bringing in Sputnik, for instance, was precisely based on science and evidence. The idea being that uh, the uh, system would evaluate data that the uh, Russian side put forward. And on the basis of the evaluation, the clearances were provided. Now, as to pricing and production, those are market-based decisions. And whichever company decided to get into it, another, another great Hyderabad company, Dr. Reddy's, uh, got into this. And uh, that's where it will go forward. If a similar approach is going on, for instance, with Serum Institute and the Oxford vaccine, and that is what in, uh, helps me sort of segue to the Bangladesh question, that's where Bangladesh came into the equation and said that irrespective of what we eventually decide in terms of testing and trials, we will in any case secure our needs by purchasing at the best possible price, a vaccine that is best suited to our existing epidemiological and public health needs, which was from their perspective, the Serum Institute vaccine, which, uh, which essentially uh, right. uh, offered them an opportunity which is well within their cold chain cap cap capabilities, a certain high level of uh, reliability, and an assurance of production. So all of this at a price that they could get. Similar decisions are taken by other countries too. So it is logical that any country would take a decision based on what is available, how it works with your ecosystem in terms of uh, what your de delivery system is. Uh, Arti talked about the ASHA workers' capacities to deliver it. Dr. Krishnaila also talked about risks involved in highly complex drugs uh, or double dose injections. Each of these things, plus your own cold chain management. Is your cold chain going to be able to manage a highly, um, highly fragile product that needs something like, I think, minus 70 degrees, as in the case of the Pfizer drug, or something that's comparatively more robust that can survive in your existing systems? So all of this is actually a fairly complicated uh, logistics exercise. It's not, it's not just production of the vaccine, but ensuring that you have the delivery capacity, ensuring that you have the cold chain uh, in place, and ensuring that you have the legal regime in place. To that right. point, I think Bangladesh's effort has been precisely on these lines. They've worked very hard to ensure that with the capacities that they have, they minimize the amount of uh, the, the sort of risk available by distributing it in terms of uh, rapid testing ca capabilities, uh, high sort of um, public health management uh, attention, and of course, uh, a lot of focus on, uh, on sort of uh, uh, the same kind of thing that we're doing, which is management of asymptomatic cases, uh, re, uh, sort of contact tracing, and keeping people, uh, ensuring that people have uh, sort of follow-up checks and, and management of, of any symptomatic uh, presentations. Um, the death rate has been comparatively low, but this is a challenge. It's a challenge that Bangladesh is worried about as the weather turns cool here, as we should too, as in any other country will, because so far the, the graph of, the, of this virus is still hard to predict. In the larger South Asian sense, I'd say uh, there is, thanks to the support of the Department of Biotechnology in particular and the Ministry of Health as well, there has been a good amount of outreach to all our South Asian partners, including through um, uh, BRAC, BRAC's testing and trials facilities. We are running courses online, which offers the, the idea of running courses sometimes is seen as, well, you know, India is offering stuff and others are just passively taking it. It's not that. These are web platforms through which there is a two-way exchange of knowledge of what, what works well in each of our neighboring countries, what we should look at, and what's working well for us that we can right. offer to others. Uh, where we have a challenge, I think, will be in terms of uh, distribution of vaccines and testing, because everything has to be handled in a way that is um, acceptable to the country's concern. So testing must be done wherever it's acceptable, testing and trials, I mean. And finally, it, it's important also that countries take the vaccine as per their requirements. So it should never look like India is insisting that this vaccine works better than that. Let everybody make an informed choice about what works best for them. Thank right. you. Okay, thanks for that. So that question uh, uh, to the effect, I mean, uh, South Asian countries was from uh, YNVS Bhaskar Sharma and uh, you uh, answered that already in uh, considerable detail. Okay, so we are now running out of time. Uh, so what I'm going to do is go reverse order, ask you for one challenge and one opportunity. Remember that, you know, the, the discussion is about crisis and cooperation and imperatives in times of the pandemic. That's the broader theme. And this discussion that we are on is about India's critical role in healthcare diplomacy policy implications. So that's just to, just to kind of uh, tee that up as a backdrop. Uh, Professor Deo, let me start with you. Uh, and uh, one, uh, uh, one, Challenge one opportunity in about 30 seconds. No, I think uh, I will probably emphasize one thing that I said earlier. Indian health 
system and sector is highly fragmented and so the ideas are going to come from diverse sub sectors diverse set of players and we look forward to coordination effort by the you know ministry of health uh, external affairs to so say how do you channel these ideas and just like we have a make in india campaign right which brings right. together all this under an umbrella probably that's the way to go even with health and given the pandemic it has come on top of agenda but for india it has been on the top of agenda in policy circles for the last couple of years which is a good thing so we've done some homework maybe it's now the right. time to sort of put things together right okay thank you for that uh, ambassador durai swami uh, one challenge one opportunity very quickly um the challenge i'd say is getting regional and domestic politics of uh, vaccine delivery and distribution right that's a complex thing we need to get that right and the opportunity i'd say that is very important for us is uh, the opportunity i think arthi also alluded to it using tech tech platforms to leapfrog fragmentation and gaps in healthcare systems in india and south asia thanks okay. uh, thank you ambassador chabra the opportunity i think is really the global market is uh, it was always open but it's now right up there for grabs with this uh, importance of the supply chains and all that and uh, the challenge of course in this particular pandemic is uh, because it will require clinical trials in each each of the markets segmented markets so that will be quite complicated okay ms ahuja uh, okay so very quickly uh, the challenge is i think the virus loves people and people seem to be loving it back Uh, so i am really scared about the increased cases and the virus in this border so that's a challenge the opportunity uh, two things one is probably a new paradigm in collaboration across borders within the country seems to be emerging and secondly uh, there's a realization across board when we attend the who meetings etc that public health sector the public systems need to be strengthened so that's a great opportunity right absolutely and the enlightening that uh, we need stronger public health systems and using this pandemic as a, as a springboard to really build something far more uh, sound and sustainable so uh, dr ella it's over to you um you know the challenge will be the, how do we vaccinate 1.3 billion population uh, number one and then reach 6 billion population of the developing world vaccinate all the 6 billion population how that is going to be challenging the opportunity is simple and i think if i can reach 20% of that and i have done my job as a scientist to the society thank you right and and you don't have to reach the entire population right i mean uh, i i know you're not an epidemiologist but there has to be a there, there there's some hit rate where you you can stop because you would have typically achieved what you want the herd immunity herd immunity yeah. will be there but partly vaccine is also required to get that herd immunity both are required okay thank you for that uh, professor vidya sagar last word yeah first of all uh, to follow up on dr ella Uh, for this pandemic you need to vaccinate between 30 to 40% of the population to reach herd immunity so to answer your question the challenge is will the cold weather especially in north india exacerbate the spread of the pandemic and can we predict that by observing the course of the pandemic the opportunity is that if we can solve that problem we would be the world leaders because nobody else has done it thus far either Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we've uh, completely run out of time. Uh, I think this was uh, a very, very insightful discussion. We've understood a lot about not just what is at play in India. Uh, there were many questions which I have not taken because many of them actually focused more in India as one would expect, and we are a large country after all. But I think the critical role that India can play in uh, delivering technology solutions, platforms apart from vaccines globally, and uh, learning back at the same time, and this is. Uh, a, a very very useful time to ha have this discussion and of course as we go into uh, this critical period of uh, uh, cold uh, winter and pollution in some parts of the country uh, covid-19 does present some new challenges uh, which we may not have been completely ready for on that note thank you very much and uh, uh, thank you to the isp once again for inviting me and it's uh, back to sandeep uh, uh, at the isp thank you thank you all after healthy discussion with valuable insights we conclude dialogue 1